Okay, okay, okay. It's a bittersweet moment. We're going to start our last session of the day. Um, the, the, the theme here is demonstrations. Um, there will be demonstrations of, of different topics. Um, so we figured since we won't have so many things in common between all the talks, we're not going to do um, the usual panel Q&A. Uh, what we're going to do is after every talk, we're just going to do a quick one-on-one -on -one Q and a just a few questions to make sure that we keep on time and we all get to go enjoy the after party on time. So when you do ask your questions on Slido, at slido.do, uh, using the code FF2023, um, you know, go and submit a question. But if you see a question that you really like, go and upvote it, because we're going to only have time for a few questions. Um, so we'll ask only the most uh, interesting and pertinent ones. All right. Um, well, uh, I think without further ado, I would like to invite to stage Alexandra Sikora. Alexandra is an open source developer. Um, she currently works at Guild working on TypeScript and GraphQL. Um, and uh, she's a bit of an expert in APIs. And she's going to tell us a little bit about the evolution of APIs. So everyone give it up for Alexandra. Uh, hi. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. So let's get started. Uh, yes, as Yanni mentioned, I work at the Guild on open source. And previously, I was working on Blitz.js framework and at Hasura. Uh, I also co-organized a TypeScript meetup in Poland. You can find me on social media. Uh, if you have any other questions that we don't get time to answer after this session, uh, you can message me on Twitter. Uh, you can also check out my blog, alexandra.codes. So, uh, as you might have guessed, this talk will be about APIs. But when I was thinking about it, and when I was doing some research, I found an interesting parallel, and it was super tempting to include it. So, here it goes. This power is fashion. And we're going to find out why during this presentation. So, firstly, I wanted to say that I'm not like super uh, obsessed with fashion, but I like to know what's up to date, and I like nice things. Um, but it's quite hard. Like, if I wanted to be up to date all the time, I would have to replace my wardrobe every few months. And that's not something you should do. That's not sustainable and not practical. And on the other hand, it's worth to notice that not everything that's new, not everything that is currently trendy is truly new. Every few years, we see a trend from the past coming back. Uh, for example, like the Dutch shoes, like the, uh, the second one that I'm currently wearing, <laughs> uh, they were invented in mid-90s. And yes, they keep coming back every few years as the season's most wanted item. And even though they had some ups and downs, this model proved that it's quite timeless. Uh, but I also don't think, don't, don't like everything that's latest in fashion, because sometimes those things can get quite crazy. And do I need to like everything? Do I need to absorb everything in order to uh, say that I'm fashionable? Probably not. But you also probably didn't come here to this front-end conference to talk about fashion. So what does it have to do with APIs? Well, during this talk, I want to show you that the evolution of APIs and the evolution of fashion actually has a lot in common. And um, we will see the trends, uh, like what trends are coming back and why the cycles in technology and cycles in the API world kind of look similar. And as attendees of this tech conference, you are likely aware that there are many projects, many frameworks that focus on full stack development. Uh, we have like Next.js, Astro, Remix, and more. And in this talk, we'll explore this area of full-stack projects, and we'll discuss the challenges working with the API layer. So firstly, why are we even talking about APIs? Well, a typical scenario for a full-stack application is that you have a client and a database or some kind of data source that you want to access. But even if your data source was publicly accessible, you can't call it from the front end because that would expose all your database credentials because th this code would end up in the browser and your credentials would be there to steal. So we usually have servers that are responsible for talking to the database. But that means that we need an API. We need this bridge that connects server and the client. However, uh, every time you have to make two separate entities talk to each other and understand each other, uh, things can get quite complicated. 
Um, even if the services are in the same repository, written in the same language. So we face problems like a lot of boilerplate, uh, repetitive error handling, and most importantly, we are losing the type safety between client and server. And all of those challenges are things that we have to bother with instead of focusing on the core of the problem we're solving and on the projects we want to ship. So now let's take a look at it from a perspective of a full stack TypeScript application. We are, uh, let's say we're in the world of an XJS application. Uh, both server and client are already closely related and both are perfectly type safe. However, having this API layer can compromise our type safety. And while we could generate types or we could type everything manually, it's an extra work and it sounds tiresome. So what can we do about it? Before I tell you, we're gonna go on a little time travel trip and we're gonna see how the world of APIs has changed in the past. Um, we're doing this to get a better idea of how trends develop and evolve. So first we go back to the 80s, the beginning of web services. So what was the beginning? Remote procedure calls, the simplest and least constrained form of an API. So let's start by explaining what that is. Look at this example of a local procedure. I have this welcome function and I can call it the same file, everything works great. And now imagine that this welcome function is on a different process, a different server. And now I would need to use the network to call it. That should sound like a common full stack scenario. So what we are doing here, we, we set up some uh, server on one side, and then we are using, using fetch API uh, to call this function. So what we are doing is we are remotely calling a procedure, which is an RPC. An RPC API is built by defining methods, and then those methods are, uh, are called with arguments. So for example, if we were using HTTP, um, we would send a POST or GET request with the uh, with an, an to an endpoint with the procedure name and the parameters in a body or query. Of course, that's not how RPC looked like in the 80s because there was no HTTP or JavaScript yet, but that was the idea. And the main promise of RPC was to be able to call remote procedures as if they were local. But there were some problems with RPC. And one of them, and probably most significant, was that this whole procedure convention made the client and server tightly coupled. And that meant that it was difficult for the server to be consumed by multiple clients. Uh, there were also some other challenges, like no request cancellation, parameters, marshalling, but the biggest issue was with being non-agnostic. So, the next thing the developers were looking for was something agnostic. So now we're going to the early 90s. And what was cool back then, apart from boy bands, Nintendo, and rollerblades? Object-oriented programming. And that's something that Corba heavily relies on. So in 1981, we have Corba, a language agnostic standard. Uh, <clears throat> a server in Corba is a process that contains objects, and the client is a process that makes calls to get those objects. Uh, we won't go into very details uh, because no one is using it anymore. But there was one major improvement for the distributed programming. And it was intro an introduction on interface definition language. So what it does, it's doing the mapping between different languages. One of the most popular ideals that you might be familiar with is currently protobuf. But the goal of being platform and language agnostic added a lot of complexity. And it caused Corba to have a very, very steep learning curve. And the mapping between completely different languages turned out to be quite difficult because we can't actually map everything. So the main issue with Corba was being complex. And then the next thing that developers were looking for was something simpler. So uh, in the late 90s, we have literally a simple object access protocol. And with SOAP, uh, the request to the API is by default an HTTP post with an XML body. Uh, the request has this SOAP envelope, which um, 
is kind of like a SOAP wrapper that identifies the requested API. And then inside you have a SOAP body, SOAP header, and so on. And the same with the response, you have the SOAP envelope, uh, SOAP body, and the requested data. Uh, that was quite an improvement after CORBA, and in fact, it's still being used today, particularly in older systems where security is crucial, such as early systems. But SOAP was XML only, and that means that requests are heavier and they require more bandwidth. It's also tightly coupled, uh, uh, the, the client is tightly coupled with the server, so if you change one thing on one side, then you have to change it on the other side as well. Um, it's by default, if you are, it's not bound to any transport layer, but by default, if you are using HTTP, you are using post requests, which are not indepotent, so there is no caching on HTTP level. Um, and in general, it was quite uh, verbose and inflexible. And the next thing that uh, the API world needed was something lighter. And around 2000s, the web started changing. The work on HTTP was progressing, and Roy Fielding from the same working group uh, created REST. And in fact, HTTP 1.1 is the first API that strictly follows REST principles. It's not a protocol like SOAP. Um, it's rather a set of architectural constraints. And by default, uh, the server is intended to be consumed by multiple clients. Uh, the data is in simple formats, for example, JSON or XML, and uh, comparing to Corva, the client and the server are completely independent. They can go over mo many, many changes, and it won't affect the communication. So to compare it to SOAP, with SOAP, you had to say a lot with your request. There was this envelope, uh, body, SOAP body, SOAP parameters, and so on. While with REST, you don't have to say that much. And <clears throat> in contrast to RPC-like APIs, uh, REST is about resources instead of procedures. So here's a comparison on how a similar API would look like in REST and RPC. Uh, in REST, you ask the server, uh, can you give me the state of this resource? Or you say, hey, here's the state of this resource, please store it. While with RPC, you are more like, can you call this procedure for me? Then, what were the challenges with REST APIs? Well, uh, one was that REST is quite hard to implement. Having those strict constraints means that you get a lot of um, guarantees about the API, but they also can be quite limiting. And in fact, many APIs that call themselves REST are not really REST, but that's a topic for probably for another talk. Um, so, some other problems were overfetching, so uh, getting unneeded data on the client or getting like large volumes of data, or N plus one problem, so having to do multiple round trips to the server to fetch data for a single view. So in general, uh, the client applications were getting more and more complex and they were rapidly changing, and REST turned out to be quite in too inflexible for that. So now it's time for something flexible. And we had GraphQL aiming to approach these challenges with REST. Uh, with GraphQL, it was fairly easy to eliminate the N plus one problem from the client perspective, as you can send only one request to the server to fetch all the data you need for, uh, for your page. You can also eliminate problems with overfetching because it's the client who decides what data it needs. Uh, the server provides it with a schema which has all the information about available resources and relationships between them. And then, based on the schema, client can decide what it needs and articulate a query. The truth is also that GraphQL shares some similar concepts to SOAP, uh, which meant, m can mean that it also shares some challenges. But this time, we have JSON instead of XML. So then, what? Like, if we have something flexible as GraphQL, and if we already solved so many problems, then what else would we even want? Um, now, remember uh, what I said in the begging, that we are thinking about it from a full-stack TypeScript application perspective. So, maybe this thing that we would need uh, is type safety out of the box, because with GraphQL, you have to generate types to have type safety, and it's working really, really well. I actually wor work on GraphQL called generator, so <laughs> I can assure you that it's working really well. But if we are already 
if we have server in TypeScript and uh, uh, front end in TypeScript, then maybe we can have it easier. So now we will go to 2020. And in 2020, we, uh, we saw that 70s and 80s were back in fashion. And it was a time when this vintage nostalgia was practically everywhere. Even if you're not into fashion, you could have seen it in TV series like Stranger Things. It was all about vintage nostalgia. Um, so, in 2020, we're going to revisit the original promise of RPC. But first, uh, I want to quickly bring up the topic of fashion. So why does fashion evolve? Well, there can be multiple reasons. We get bored, we are looking to stand out, we want to uh, express ourselves, and we want to look different than other people, so we come up with new trends. Uh, there are also fashion designers or influencers that uh, kind of influence the mainstream trend. But there's also another factor that drives the evolution of fashion and that's the world around it. So for example, the pandemic led us to uh, having more and more oversized clothes because in the times where we had this, uh, like a lot of worries with the state of the world, we all wanted to feel comfy and protected. And interestingly, around the same time, there was a shift in the world of APIs. One technology in particular had a significant impact on the development of new tools. Um, if you are not familiar with Prisma, it's a type safe ORM and it makes working with database incredibly easy. So after it was released in a as beta in April 2020, we saw a surge in tools like uh, Blitz, JS, TRPC, Redwood, and all of them leveraged the Prisma's excellent developer experience. Because suddenly dealing with database became much, much easier. So it was time for APIs to catch up. It was time for APIs to bring this uh, Prisma's experience closer to the front end. So let's revisit the picture of the server and client and the full stack types for application. How can we minimize the challenges and the problems with the API layer? We can do it by minimizing the layer itself. And this is what some of those tools do. Like we have a TRPC query and mutation procedures, please RPC mit, uh, mutation and query resolvers. Quick City, Remix Loader Pattern, React Server Components, and many, many more that I don't even include on this slide. So uh, what they try to do is they try to, they, they try to minimize this APA layer so that you don't have to be bothered by it. It doesn't mean that they remove the APA layer, it's still there, but it's not as visible as before. So we're gonna see some examples and for some of them, I will uh, see the code in, uh, show you the code in the editor, and for some, I just have a few code snippets. We'll start with Blitz RPC. So here I have a server function. It's called get project, and inside what I'm doing, I'm parsing the data to make sure that the input uh, arguments are correct, and then I'm calling the database to find a project. I could do anything else that I, uh, I would want, like call other APIs and uh, do some other operations on the database. But now let's see how uh, we can use it on the front end. On the front end, you can see that, maybe I can draw, yeah. I'm importing this, this get project function from the, uh, from the file that I showed you before. I'm using something called use query from Blitz.js RPC. This is basically the same as Tanstack query. It's just a small wrapper on top of it that adds uh, a few Blitz.js functionalities. Um, I'm providing the function that I just imported, and uh, I'm also providing the arguments. But here's the interesting thing. Um, I'm going to hide it now. Okay, so I told you before that you can't call the database from the client because that exposes your credentials, and this is kind of what we are doing. So uh, what Blitz does and why it works is that during build time, it replaces this import with an HTTP fetcher function so that this server code never lands in the browser. In the browser, there will be an HTTP call to this server function because also what Blitz does, it creates RPC endpoints from all of your server uh, queries and mutations. So that was Blitz. And now I'm going to show you something else, which is TRPC. OK. 
asking? Uh, okay, it's there. I hope that the font is good. Uh, it's big enough. Okay, so it's still loading the, the dependencies. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to uh, create RPC um, queries and mutations. Okay, so what I have here is this, wait a second. Okay, what I have here is this app router. And in this app router, um, I'm creating all the server functions that I want to be available. So for example, here I have a something called post. This is a public procedure and, oh, it doesn't work. Hmm. So maybe I can, okay, I will just look there. My neck is gonna hurt, but it's gonna work. <laughs> I hope so. No, it doesn't work. Uh, Okay, awesome. Uh, so, here is this API, AP, uh, a TRPC API route, and here I have this app router. And inside, I can, as I mentioned before, I can declare all the procedures that I want to be available. Uh, one example is this post procedure. So I'm returning something from the database. This is just a simple uh, JSON object that is supposed to mock the database. Uh, I also have something like greeting, where I can declare the uh, input that this uh, procedure accepts. And here I also can declare the handler that's supposed to run whenever we call this function. So now how to, how to use it on the client? Um, on the client, we will use something called TRPC. And this is, uh, this is a client where we provide the type of app router, which is exported from the file that I showed you before. And this TRPC client knows all the information about available procedures. So we see that there is something like post and greeting. So when we use it in the front-end comp component, if I, for example, remove this, and I type a dose, I see that there is something like post and greeting. So if I go to greeting and another dot, I can see that I can use use query. And now um, in this use query, we'll also see what arguments are available. So this is more or less how RPC works. I'm not gonna go into uh, in diff with any of those things, but I want to give you like a sneak peek of how different solutions work. So now let me go back to my slides. No, not like that. No, also not like that. <laughs> it's not the end yet. Okay. Yeah, sorry for the spoilers. Okay, and now what if we can push it even further and have the backend code inside of, uh, in the same file as the client code. So as we have Mishka, uh, the creator of Quick, as the next speaker, I uh, won't show you Quick City. I will show you the other thing uh, because I'm sure he will sh uh, talk about uh, Quick more during his session. So here's an example. Uh, in this code snippet, I don't even have the server code in a separate file. I have... Uh, I use use query from Tanstack query, and I have the server code, the call to the database inside of it. So what happens here is that this server dollar function um, extracts it to a separate place, and then it also, the same as bleeds, replaces it with a fetcher function. So again, this component is, is a client component, but the uh, server code, the call to the database, will never land in the browser. And then another thing, it's React server components. And here I can push it 
even further, because I don't even have any wrappers, I don't even have any macro functions. I directly call the database in the component. So I can do this because all of this will be computed on the server. And with this, with React Server Components, in the, it's the server who drives what data is fetched and what UI is rendered, and the client side um, becomes only responsible for the UI interactions. So that should sound kind of similar, like back in the good times around 2026, uh, when the Fila Disruptor sneakers I'm currently wearing on my feet and the PHP were born. So um, I'm almost done now. And I think that, um, you know, if this talk was like one year ago, I would probably be done by now. Uh, but I want to leave you with one more thing. So look at this iconic name, Total Look, from 2001 by Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake. This was something ridiculous, and this was something that was being laughed at for years. But now we have it back on the runways, and we have the name Total Looks back in this season's trends. So, um, so we see another trend coming back to fashion, and what about APIs? Um, all the solutions with RPC I showed you are really, really awesome. And we are in this world of full stack TypeScript application, and they do fit them, fit it very, very well. But what if we now want the server and the client decoupled? Or what if we want the server to, like all this procedure, uh, to be accessible by different clients? Maybe we have a separate desktop application and a mobile application. So what can we do about it? Well, we can go back and use REST or GraphQL, but the problem is that now the bar is much higher. TypeScript is de facto a standard, so type safety is something non-negotiable. And there is a new trend in the world of APIs, and it's, um, the trend is that we see REST being back again. So we have tools like Bridge.js, Stainless, and FETS bringing it back. And I want to show you one of them, uh, which is FETS. Okay, it loads. No. Okay, I think I have to do the same trick and look there. Okay, so what is FETS? It's, um, it's fully type safe client for your REST APIs. And how it works, you use this create client uh, function from FETS and then you pass an open API specification to it, a type of it, so that the client uh, shouldn't be unknown. Uh, this is something I found uh, today when I was preparing this example and something that I will fix uh, after this talk. Okay, so let me go back. Okay, so now we see that this client, if it has the open API specification, which is a, a way to describe a REST API, it will know everything about the av available endpoints, the parameters, and the returned types. So if I want to use it on the front end, I will go to this index page. Uh, I can see that uh, I can also extract some types from this open API specification. And inside, um, no, it shouldn't be unknown. Uh, wait a second. I promise it works locally for me. Okay, basically, uh, when you use this client, you will have information about the available endpoints. And you will be able to use get or post depending on what the, uh, what the API uh, accepts. And then you will also have the type of the response, which shouldn't be this. But it's okay because this is a new project and I will have something to do after this presentation. Um, but. Let me go back to the slides. 
Okay. In general, what Fetch does, it's, it gives you type safety out of the box. There's no runtime overhead because you won't end up with your schema on the, in the bundle because it's just type, so it will all, all be uh, stripped, stripped from the bundle. And it gives you all the IDE features like go to definition, so it will make your life easier. So let's summarize. Uh, all of this may look like we are going in circles, but maybe we are just getting closer to the core of the problem, and maybe all the like this this downright, downward spiral represents all the layers of boilerplate, and maybe uh, we are just pursuing the best developer experience. And same as with fashion, we are all different, and we have different styles and preferences, and so are our project. So. The same as we compose, like we should compose our wardrobes based on our needs. We need to evaluate the unique needs of our project and team when deciding on the API solution. And something worth to remember is that a thing that is super trendy at a given time might not suit everyone. So it's good to know your options. And my goal with this talk was to present you with different options that you have. But it's also worth to know that it's, it may not always be the best idea to jump to the newest thing only because it's hyped. So uh, take from all the options what fits you best. And also don't hate on the previous API solutions because they are just like last year's clothes. They still serve a purpose. And remember to embrace change and be ready to adjust your approach. Like whether it's like trying a new outfit or trying a new API paradigm. Uh, adaptability is the key in both words. So what's next? Maybe in, the, uh, in this age of large language models, we'll have a new API paradigm that is so generalized that AI can create and consume it. Uh, I don't know, but I'm very eager to see, and ha I hope you are too. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alexandra. Um, while we have Mishko set up his laptop, um, mm -hmm. why don't you join me here? Uh, yes, we yes. can casually lean at the corner of the table, fashionably. Yep. Yep. Um, thank you for the presentation. So, um, just one Can I question. sit or should I stand? Um, would you like to sit? Yes. All right, let's sit. <laughs> I wouldn't want to deny you the opportunity to sit behind this beautiful table. Yep. So, um, so uh, FETS, FD, is this a project that you created? Uh, this is something that uh, colli my colleague at the Guild it's created. This is something that we, we kind of both work on together. Uh, it's a brand new thing. We are just basically like in the process of you know, launching it, like nice. polishing it. But can we try it today? Or? Yes, yes, you can try it today. If you go to, well, I should have had it on the slide. But if you Google FETS <laughs> uh, and the Guild, you should be able to, to see it. We have a documentation. If you also go to, uh, the guild.dev, and then you search through uh, solutions, then you're going to find FETS there too. Nice. And uh, we have a question about FETS here. Um, does it work with you know edge runtimes? It, does it have any dependencies to Node or anything like no, that? No, no. There are no dependencies to Node. It works on Cloud for Workers, BAN, Node, whatever you wish. All right. Um, well, I think that's all the audience questions we have time for, except that somebody keeps submitting a question called, can you press the clicky clicky? Uh, I don't know who you are and what you mean, but uh, if you would like to come, let, let me know afterwards, or if it's one of these buttons over here. <laughs> uh, these are behind glass, I can't, so yeah. we cannot. No. I wish I could. All right, uh, but if you want to ask questions to Alexander, she's uh, invited you to uh, contact her over Yes, uh, or during the after party. I will be here all the time. All right, uh, let's give it up for Alexander. Thank you. Thank you.